G'day, I'm Paul. So a little while ago, I criticized Toyota for the styling update of the 70 series. I eat my words. It actually looks significantly better here in person. Maybe it's the accessories and stuff like that, don't know. But anyway, this is the new Toyota Land Cruiser 70 series. This is the four cylinder version. So uh, I'm excited to drive this today to see whether this is a step forward or whether this is a step backwards. Uh, this is the GXL dual cab. So this is priced at just under $84,000. If that is too expensive, the entire range kicks off at just under 76 grand. So it is still pretty expensive for what it is. The entry level still has windy windows. Uh, so what does this compete with? Well, it doesn't really have any competitors in that sort of rugged off-road uh, payload carrying segment. Now, today we're gonna to do a detailed review of this. We're gonna do a bit of light off-roading. If you do wanna skip ahead to other parts of this review, you can use the time codes that are on the screen. We actually have a stack more content coming with the four cylinder, the V8, and some interesting comparisons shortly. So please make sure you subscribe to the channel and you hit the bell icon so you can find out when all of that stuff finally goes live as well. Now, before I kick off with design, I need to give a massive shout out to my mates at Werribee Toyota. They've supplied us with this vehicle. Uh, the press cars are still coming back from Toyota's launch, so we couldn't get a hold of uh, one of those for a little while yet. So these guys have come up with the goods. They also gave us a hand with the 300 series when that came out as well. So if you do want to buy a car, you're in Victoria or want to travel to Victoria, go to Werribee Toyota and see my mate Nick down there. He'll sort you out. Okay, so let's get into the design. Uh, this is Sandy Torp, kind of a classic 70 series colour. Uh, your optional colours are 675 bucks. And sorry about the flies, I'm going to be waving my hand around my face doing the Australian wave a little bit. Um, this car has a stack of accessories fitted as well. So some of the stuff you see here may not actually be standard. So just triple check that if you do go in to buy one, which you can't at the moment because they've paused orders, but that's another story altogether. Um, so stuff like this is uh, optional and obviously fitted to this car. Now, what has changed here? So if you look at the front of this, uh, the bonnet is different. They've also taken a lot of inspiration from previous generations of Land Cruiser and also 70 series. So uh, this lettering here, Toyota along the front there, this vent grill up the top there. Uh, you've also got uh, these outboard indicators as well, uh, fender flares. Has all come from different generations of these vehicles and they've really tried to make this a bit of a retro beast, something that people want to, to drive around because it has that nostalgic uh, presence about it. Uh, beneath the bull bar here, you've got live axles, front and rear, coil sprung at the front. Uh, it now comes uh, standard with front and rear diff locks, uh, depending on the spec that you go for. The four cylinder diesel is available uh, across the range. And the interesting thing as well with the four cylinder, given this is such a workhorse, they've had to do a lot of work to the cooling for uh, the engine and transmission as well to ensure that it is able to withstand the type of driving that these vehicles do on mine sites day to day. So uh, knowing Toyota, they've, they've always very cautious with everything that they do. And I suspect this has gone under a lot of endurance testing to ensure that it is actually capable here. That's some of the stuff that we're gonna be testing as part of our comparison in the new year as well. Jump over to the side. Uh, around here, I mentioned those fender flares. Uh, I like the look of that. It gives it a bit of a rugged, uh, rugged design. I like those wheels as well. So dark graphite finish, auto locking hubs. Uh, outside of that front and rear disc brakes, nothing sort of too special. Comes standard with uh, all-terrain tires as well. Uh, big indicator here on the side, GXL over here, snorkel on the GXL dual cab. Now, manual mirrors, they're still here. Manual windows are still here as well on the entry level, so it is um, very nostalgic in that sense. Aluminium side steps. Here's another one of those accessories along with those tinted windows. Come around to the back. Actually, one thing I will point out as well, it's only the single cab version of this that has side airbags and a five-star safety rating. The rest of these only have front airbags. So if you do go for the dual cab version, you are gonna miss out on a couple of those uh, safety bits and pieces. Uh, come right to the back with me. So around the back here, one thing that is worth keeping in mind when this vehicle is delivered, it doesn't actually come with a tray. So that's something you need to invest in on your own. Uh, it just comes as a, as a chassis and then you work with it unless you get the wagon, which is obviously just a complete vehicle. Uh, so the dimensions and the payload capacity is going to depend entirely on what you fit to the back here. But before you fit this, and these, depending on what you're getting, can weigh between 100 to 300 kilos, and then depending on what you want to put into it. So you're gonna have to do the maths on your own, but payload of a little over 1300 kilos here in the GXL uh, dual cab and it has a GCM of over 7,000 kilos. So by the time you account for three and a half tons of brake towing capacity, this is a really capable vehicle when it comes to 
all of those things. One thing that I did notice a lot of you complain about though is the rear axle and where it sits in terms of its width. That hasn't changed, the track hasn't been adjusted on the rear and that is something that you will have to do aftermarket if it's uh, of concern to you, but it is something I have noticed a lot of you point out in our previous review of this. So let me know what you reckon about the design. Do you reckon it looks good? Do you think they've done enough here to the design to keep it looking unique and interesting? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Okay, so we are inside the 70 series. We'll start off with the key. So there it is there, just a normal looking key. You have a remote control to lock and unlock the car as well. Stick that in the ignition barrel. And that. So you can see here that the design changes are only very modest. This still retains the same sort of hard wearing plastics that we've seen in previous generations of um, 70 series. So not a great deal has changed in that regard. They have updated though the infotainment, some of the connectivity, and as you can see here as well, now you've got this automatic transmission shifter too. This used to just be manual. Uh, so that's sort of sitting up nice and high and I don't know. The design of this is interesting. I, I know that they've done the height because you need to be able to change gears and without sort of leaning too far forward, but it does make this kind of look a little bit strange here in the center, especially with your four-wheel drive controls just hidden off to the side. But anyway, that's, uh, that's I guess, personal opinion. Um, now, in terms of your touch points, very hard and not so hard, not too bad. Uh, we've got our durometer here. We've tested the main surfaces in this cabin. If you want to see how this car compares to others that we've tested before, so we've got the link in the description below. Now, build quality, what's it like? That's very, very wonky in the center there. The rest of this feels all right. And this is what the door slam sounds like. Now let's talk infotainment. Uh, so it is this tiny little 6.7 inch display. It does have some improved functionality though. So you have AM and FM radio. You now have four speakers here inside the cabin, which is great. Uh, in addition to that, you have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Both of those are wide. Uh, I'll show you what Apple CarPlay looks like first. Um, so there you go, full screen integration. All sort of works uh, pretty straightforward. This is also where you're gonna get your maps as well because uh, it doesn't have any inbuilt satellite navigation. Uh, in addition to that, you can just pair your phone with Bluetooth. You also have the ability to connect direct with USB here through the port on the screen. Uh, and you can also select iPod connectivity. In addition to that, a couple of other features, you can change the theme if you want between dark and light and bluish and then you've got a settings menu as well i don't love the fact that there is no volume knob here you just have these controls off to the side uh, or the steering wheel controls but toyota has these tiny little graduations for audio so when you're trying to go up and down you've got to press it about a thousand times it'd be good just to have a volume knob there that would just make life much easier now head of the driver as well kill that fan. You've got a smaller, around four inch display off to the right here. So this is good because it gives you trip computer and a couple of other sort of uh, bits and pieces in there as well, in addition to your analog gauges as well. So it is a big step forward from the previous generation in terms of the functionality and the ease of use as well. So let's talk safety. You've got autonomous emergency braking. You have a lane departure warning. Uh, Traffic sign recognition, that's uh, about it. Uh, ABS brakes, stability control, just all that standard stuff. No parking sensors, no reverse camera, which I reckon is just a little bit cheap. Just fit that stuff, guys. I just don't understand why it can't be fitted to a vehicle like this, and especially at this price. And this is what the horn sounds like. Now moving on to practicality, and we'll start off with your connectivity. So some big changes here. You've got one USB-A port up the top here, uh, attached to the infotainment system, but two USB-C ports for charging and a 12 volt outlet over here as well. So yeah, it's a connectivity there. Um, in terms of storage, you've got uh, cup holders galore. So you've got one here, one here. It's actually not cup holders galore, is it? It's just two cup holders. Um, but look at that, fits your fancy latte. And that's uh, kind of the coffee that a lot of 70 series owners are now drinking because I see a lot of these in the city <laughs> have become the new Land Rover Defender for the type of people that don't go off road and drink that type of coffee. Uh, bottle holder. Sort of fits in okay there, no teeth to hold it in place. Uh, no bottle storage on the driver's side either. Other storage, you've got this center console here with a little coin tray and then this sort of enormous drop down here as well. So plenty of um, space there for odds and ends and then a decent sized glove box as well. Now comfort, uh, air conditioning, that's about it. 
So you just manually adjust that. You've also got individual uh, controls here for the intensity of the air conditioning in addition to the temperature that comes out as well. Manual seat adjustment for both the uh, driver and front passenger and then steering adjustment comes in both tilt and reach form. On our reach test, uh, yeah, all of this stuff is easy to reach while you're driving. Okay, before I hop in the second row, let me show you what it does. Oh, it's also worth pointing out, this car is fitted with uh, accessory seat covers. So um, the entry level gets vinyl, but uh, this GXL grade gets um, same seats that we've tested previously, but um, this one is seat covers. So let me show you what you can do here. So you can flip this forward to get access to your jack and other bits and pieces. You've got limited amount of storage beneath there as well. You can also just drop this out of the way if you get rid of your headrest too, if you need to fit something across there. Um, yeah, let me hop in, got a grab handle up the top here. Oh, this is a tight space. Yeah, so I've got my uh, driver's seat in my regular driving position. I've got no knee room at all. Toe room's not too bad. Headroom's pretty good as well. Uh, not exactly a space I'd want to be seated for an extended period of time. Uh, no charging or air vents or anything like that back here. Manual up and down on the windows. We'll see if they go all the way down. Almost. Okay, so we've just hit the road in the four-cylinder 70 series. Now, let me run you through the specs here. This is using the same engine as the Hilux, so 2.8-litre turbocharged four-cylinder diesel. Difference being that this produces 150 kilowatts of power and 500 newton meters. So it's not like the GR Sport, which is 550 newton meters. It's made it to the same six speed automatic transmission, but there have been a number of changes under the bonnet. So they've beefed up engine and transmission cooling. In addition to that, some of the cooling hardware has also been moved upwards uh, into the engine bay as well. So uh, there are some sort of changes there. So it's not just straight out of a Hilux. One thing I'm going to point out immediately, and this is something that we're still getting checked out. I haven't been able to get an answer on this just yet, uh, but it feels to me like the air conditioning isn't as powerful. That was one of the standouts for me with uh, the V8 70 series, that it always felt just intense in terms of the air conditioning. This, on the other hand, doesn't feel as powerful. So checking with Toyota to see whether it is the same air conditioning equipment as the V8, and I will uh, pop a comment in the comment section below and pin it as well once I hear back from them. So keep an eye out for that. Now, what does all this feel like behind the wheel? I'm gonna give this a little poke here. <laughs> You're probably not gonna to wanna to hear this, but this feels so much quicker than the V8. The V8 is sort of fairly lazy down low, and you know, once it picks up a bit of steam, it really moves along okay, but this is in another league altogether, and this doesn't have really that much more torque than the V8, but it feels a whole lot more urgent and it just feels like it's ready to mumbo a whole lot more as well. So when we go on our faster lap, I'll be curious to see what this um, what this feels like, but early signs are pretty good. In terms of the transmission, it feels just like a Hilux. If you sort of sneak up on it, it'll jump down a couple of gears without too many dramas. You can also manually select gears as well by shifting it across, and that will then lock that gear in as you go. Now with this engine comes in theory some economy gains. So average fuel economy is claimed to be under 10 litres per 100 k's. Uh, this figure here, 15.1, it's kind of a bit of a pointless figure because this car, we picked it up literally brand new. So it had just had its uh, tray fitted. It's just done its uh, uh, detailing and, and uh, pre-delivery checks. So uh, it just went straight out here for 150 k's or thereabouts. So it is uh, brand new. That fuel economy will no doubt come down, but that is one of the big advantages here of the four cylinder. It is going to be more economical in comparison to the V8. That's just as simple as that equation gets but obviously you are losing out on four of those eight cylinders. And I have always thought in the back of my mind that, uh, that the V8 was probably a bit underrated in terms of its uh, capacity and, and ability. So I think a lot of people that do modifications on the V8 extract almost immediately a stack more torque out of it. So uh, if apples for apples in stock form, the four cylinder is obviously punchier, but if you were to go and modify these, the V8 would have a whole lot more headroom on it. Now let's talk about the ride. Um, look, it feels about the same. This is slightly lighter with the four cylinder over the V8. So you do get uh, an economy gain there and also a slight ride advantage as well. But ultimately this has uh, live axle front and rear, leaf springs at the rear, coils at the front. There is only so much you can do in terms of the ride and when it is unladen, it's 
not exactly amazing, but it's it's also not terrible as well. It sits nicely sort of in between there, especially with the tray. More weight you add to it, the better the ride's gonna feel as well. Okay, let's jack the speed up for our sine waves to 130. If you live in the Northern Territory, that is your maximum speed limit, and you're likely to find some roads like this in the outback as well. This is our sine wave. It's basically a consecutive set of bumps, one after the other. We always attack this at highway speeds in each car to see how it compares. And I'll be keen to see what the overlay, overlay looks like between the uh, V8 version as, and, uh, and the four-cylinder version. But it feels quite nice over that without any dramas at all. Now, I know this is probably just a pre-delivery thing, but these wing mirrors at 130 start tilting down and currently all I can see is the ground. So I assume that's just a pre-delivery thing that they will um, just need to tighten, but hopefully that's not the case in all of these when they are delivered. Um, okay, let's head off to our bumpy road. We do this at 90 k's an hour. It's a shocker of a road. If you head to the outback somewhere, you're probably gonna find much worse than this, but um, it's just a good indication of what you could expect chair is about to fall out of its hinges. All right, we've got a condensed uh, high frequency sine wave coming up here as well. We'll see how it goes on this. We'll call it the rattler. <laughs> nice. Yeah, very, very impressive. Now, I should call out at this point as well that um, this isn't a full-time four-wheel drive system, so it's predominantly two-wheel drive, so it's sending torque to the rear. And then uh, you can select four-wheel drive high range when you're on unsealed surfaces. And I'll run you through how that works when you do a bit of light off-roading. Okay, so let's go for a faster lap around the track. Yes, I know most people aren't ever going to be driving like this, but we test all of our cars back to back in the same way. Uh, I'm just gonna press the power button. <laughs> that way we can have the most performance possible for our lap around the track. Now I am curious to see how this feels compared to the V8 that we drove here a little while ago, so. Yeah, right, so it is a lot more eager. This actually feels significantly quicker than the V8. I'm genuinely surprised by this. Yeah, it is picking up pace remarkably well. I'll be keen to see when we do our performance run 0 to 100 how it compares to the V8, but if this is anything to go by, it's hauling ass. Um, steering feel also feels a little different as well. It doesn't feel as heavy as the V8 does. So it's still a hydraulically assisted steering rack, but to me it doesn't feel anywhere near as heavy. Let's see what it's like here along this faster section up at the back. <laughs> I'm surprised how quick this is. Look, it's no sports car, but um, it is absolutely hauling. I'm having to fight with it a little bit to get us what we need, but it is getting there. Oh, here comes our back straight, roll onto that. Yeah, nice. Sort of getting along really nicely there. All right, there you go, very impressive. This four cylinder is, is genuinely impressing me. I'm uh, really pleased with this. Uh, now, one thing I did notice uh, just here, on our skid pan, we've actually got what they call the city circuit, which is where they used to durability test uh, cars before they were released. And it simulates a city area and you can do slow speeds and stop and reverse and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, we use this for uh, a bit of dynamic handling, at lower speed, but higher intensity. What I noticed with this is uh, with the hydraulic steering rack, I don't know whether it's underpowered, uh, and we have driven other vehicles here with hydraulic steering racks before, but none of them have been this bad. So when you start applying a lot of steering input, the hydraulic system has to do its work and send hydraulics around the vehicle to assist your steering. But then what happens is if you pair a lot of wheel work with throttle, all of a sudden you get to these points here where the steering is so heavy, where you don't have any assistance at all. And look, in theory, you're not going to have this issue driving this vehicle in day-to-day -day life, but it kind of tells me that this uh, hydraulic assistance system is perhaps just a little bit underdone, because I haven't noticed this in Hilux before, so I don't know whether they've selected a different system or whether it's just the added weight here in the 70 series that causes those load-ups, but 
just something to be mindful of, especially if you're doing off-roading and stuff where you've got a lot of throttle, the engine's using all of its, its power, and then it hasn't got enough in reserve there for the hydraulic system. That seems to be when it, it comes into play, because off the throttle, you can have as much steering input as you want, and it doesn't really affect it too much. So yeah, just something to keep in mind. So what about road noise? Um, look, it's on all terrains. It's got a giant snorkel. There's a lot of wind and road noise that comes into the cabin, especially on coarse chip country roads, but only to be expected uh, in a car like this. Plus the passenger seat rattles when you go over bumpy stuff as well. This is how it went up against our calibrated sound meter. If you do want to see how this compares to other cars we've tested before, there's a link in the description below. So I mentioned before, towing capacity, three and a half tonnes with a brake trailer. You've got an enormous turning circle as well, uh, a little over 14 metres. So you're going to need a lot of space here to pack this thing up and do a U-turn in the street. Okie dokie, time to do some performance testing. Uh, I've got our old numbers up here from the V8, so we'll see how this compares. Uh, now, I just wanted to tell you about Help Me Car Expert. Uh, if you go to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert, you can use some of the cool tools on our site. Obviously, if you want a 70 series, you know that you want a 70 series, but we have a stack of car comparison tools, uh, including a car chooser if you don't know exactly what you want. So just go to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert, and then we'll hook you up with one of our accredited dealers. Unfortunately, a lot of them don't have stock of a 70 series, so won't be able to help you there, but um, other cars probably. Uh, okay, so let's do a little bit of performance testing. So we're gonna go from zero to 100, uh, and then we'll go through to 120 to see what that 80 to 120 overtaking time is like. I'm gonna pop it into power mode here, or power haul mode. I'm gonna turn off traction control as well. Let's see how we go. I'm gonna load up the throttle first, and just to see how that performs, build up a bit of boost. Nice, all right. So here we go, that's 80. There's 100, we're gonna run out of room here. Yeah, we're gonna to have to take our exit road. All right, there's 120. <laughs> yeah, right, uh, I was hoping it'd be a little bit quicker than that, but let's see how we go. Normally when a car is super slow, we end up out here in the boondogs. Um, okay, so let's have a look. Zero to 100, 11.78 seconds. So it is actually significantly quicker than the V8. I think the V8 was about 15 seconds. Uh, 80 to 120, 10.85 seconds. So that was about two seconds quicker as well. So what you can see there is that once this gets up to 80, it starts losing a bit of steam, whereas the V8 was quite strong in that midsection and only two seconds slower between 80 to 120. So it is good off the line there, but it does taper off a lot there. So, um, all right, let's go back and do a stop from 100 k's an hour and see if that's any better. Okie dokie, everything is secure. We're gonna need a decent run up here to get up to 100. As I hold on for dear life. All right, here we go. Okie dokie. Alright. See how that went. So, 100 to zero. Uh, 3.31 seconds, 45.51 metres. So I think that's an improvement on the stopping distance as well. And I think part of that comes down to this weighing a little bit less. So there you go, uh, that is pretty good. Now the thing you've all been waiting for, how quick does it go in reverse? So I'll turn traction control off because I think the Hilux was quicker in reverse with that off. So here we go. That's 40-ish kilometres an hour. Okay, time to do a little bit of light off-roading. Uh, yeah, look, we, we only really do light off-roading here. We leave the hardcore stuff to the other channels. And if you are going to be modifying this, you're probably going to be going a whole lot more hardcore anyway. So uh, let me run you through the core specs first. So you've got an approach angle of 33 degrees. That's the angle of the face you can approach before you hit anything at the front of the car. Departure angle of 27 degrees, which is the same, but in reverse. Keep in mind, they're going to change if you fit aftermarket accessories to the vehicle. So that is just worth keeping in mind. 302 mil running clearance, so that is different to ground clearance. So uh, again, keep that in mind as well. I think I ran through this in our previous 70 series review. Uh, weighting depth of 700 mil, this also has a snorkel as well to assist with additional breathing. And then in addition to all of that, you've got front and rear diff locks that are activated here using this switch. They don't operate in two wheel drive high range. Then you have uh, two wheel drive high range for driving on sealed surfaces, four wheel drive high range, 
and then you have four-wheel drive low range as well. Now, we are going to go through our first obstacle in two-wheel drive. We do this just to see what the traction control system's like, and this is basically just an offset mogul, nothing sort of too crazy, but it will give us an idea of how well the traction control system copes when we have a wheel in the air. So this is gonna kick up the uh, driver's side rear. So here we go, I'm gonna roll onto the throttle now. I'll just see how willing this is to do its thing. So you can see the traction control light flashing there. I'll just keep rolling onto the throttle there, see if it can sort itself out. Okay, I'm pretty much, there we go, that's full throttle there and it's not really doing anything. So what I'm gonna do now is press, let's try pressing the power button just to see if that makes any difference here. Not really, all it's doing is adjusting the throttle map to make the throttle inputs sharper. Okay, uh, last thing I'll do is just disable traction control with one push of that button. Press that, see how that goes. Okay, so that's just spinning the wheel, that's not getting us anywhere. So, uh, yeah, not a good start. I would have thought the uh, traction control system in this would have been a little better just in terms of being able to limit wheel slip there. So, uh, we'll just carry a bit of momentum through here. Gee, even now it's struggling. This is really not good at all. I'm pinned to the board there and it's not doing anything. All right, I'm gonna have to just bail out of this. Um, yeah, that's really disappointing that it just doesn't have the goods to get out of something as simple as that, which most dual cab utes uh, have no problems with. So, all right, we'll go around this and uh, we're going to attack the other side now, uh, but in four wheel drive high range. Okay, so uh, the other side's the same. The principle is we get two wheels off the ground, but I'm gonna flick this down to four wheel drive high range. There it is there, that's activated. You can't use this on sealed surfaces. And if you do wanna find out why, click here to watch a video that we shot before that explains it all. So yet again, we just want to see how the traction control system copes here with two wheels with limited traction. So we've got one wheel at the back there that's in a rut, one wheel at the front there that has limited traction. I'm just going to roll onto the throttle here, and we'll just see how it goes. We are getting a decent amount of angle there. Half throttle. There we go, just had to be a little greedier there with the throttle. There's a decent amount of angle there, um, but yeah, look, the traction control system seems to work much better there when it's paired with four-wheel drive high range. So, uh, thank goodness for that, because I was a little bit worried there for a second. Okay, time for our hill. So the way that this works is normally attack this in four-wheel drive low range. So slot that into neutral, bring this down all the way to four-wheel drive low range. So that switches traction and stability control off. I'm gonna leave the diff lock off for the moment. So we'll just see how it goes um, just on its own here. So I've left uh, front and rear diff locks off. We'll see how it copes with this climb. It's all pretty dry, so it should be okay. We'll see how we go. Just constant throttle up here as well. Yeah, piece of cake. Very nice. Okay, we've got our little mud bath here. Send it through that. Okie dokie. Now, time for our hill descent here. So we've got hill descent control. So I'll activate that, we'll crest and then climb over and see how we go. Okay, so get to the top here, let go of the brake and just see how it goes with the descent. Yeah, nice and steady. No dramas at all there, piece of cake. Um, all right, let's head back to our hill. Okay, so that was kind of a walk in the park. So uh, let's just lock the front and rear diffs anyway and just see how it all goes. Okay, well, it's front diff locked, rear diff locked. I thought what I'll do now is just come up the hill and come to a stop about there somewhere and just roll onto the throttle and see how we go. Yeah, piece of cake. With front and rear diff locks, I this thing can pretty much go anywhere. Very nice, the only thing you've got to keep in mind is that it massively increases your turning radius. So I'm gonna switch both of those off now as we go to our hill. There we go. All right. Okay, rock time. 
it's uh, I think probably the the best thing about the four cylinder is actually just the fact that you don't need to fuss about with a manual transmission when you're driving over rocks as an example it's just one less thing to worry about yeah this has a stack of ground clearance which means driving over this is a piece of cake but it's also really comfortable as well what you find with a lot of dual cab utes is they're not really tuned for driving around without a load and you end up on stuff like this and it's just throwing you around everywhere whereas this is actually quite nice very good walk into the park now last up a little bit of water crossing um, yeah it is fairly dry here today we don't have a huge amount in there but we've got more than enough waiting depth even when it is full so it should be good a little splash through here first okay and here comes our water crossing all right how deep is it today no not very deep <laughs> I think it's like 500 mil or something, so we'll just cruise through here. There you go. Piece of cake. No dramas at all. And you've got the snorkel there as well for good measure. I'll do that climb out of here. I suspect this won't touch anything on the way out, but you never know. Yeah, nice. Very nicely done. Okay, so there it is. The Toyota Land Cruiser 70 Series. My summary here off-road is that with the four-cylinder, it seems to do everything that the V8 does. It is a little disappointing there with those traction controls. Ultimately, if you are going to be driving this off-road, you'll probably switch traction control off anyway, uh, because this system definitely isn't designed to do any of that stuff. So uh, keep that in mind. And if you are buying one of these, you're probably going to modify it as well. So <laughs> it's kind of a redundant opinion anyway. Righto, so what do we reckon about the 70 series, the four cylinder version? I'm sorry to say this, but this is infinitely better than the V8 when it comes to punch. Like it absolutely hauls. The auto transmission is good. It does pretty much everything that you would expect it to do better than the V8. But there are some caveats here. So like, I don't know if it's just a perception thing, but I always remember the air conditioner in a 70 series to be absolutely insanely good. So I am still checking with Toyota to see whether it is a different air conditioner, but it feels like it's nowhere near as good as it is in the V8. So I will update the comments section below with an answer to that when I do get it. But outside of that, um, visually Toyota has kept this and the V8 exactly the same. And that's important because I think they know that a lot of people will rationally go towards the, the four cylinder because it's got an auto transmission, it's more efficient, etc., etc., And they don't want anyone to be judged when they're driving it. Uh, but I do think that the four cylinder in this is a winner. So we do have a V8 coming. We're gonna test that as well in this new shape. I suspect it's gonna be the same as the previous ones we've done, but we'll test it again anyway, just to be on the safe side. I do welcome all the new features that have been added to this as well, but it is still kind of silly that you have to adjust the mirrors yourself and. You know, the aerial you have to do yourself, it's just weird stuff. Anyway, let me know what you reckon in the comments section below. Have you tried to order one of these? Uh, as of recording this video, they're still not taking any orders and they're switching people over who have ordered one into one of these instead. Have you switched to a four cylinder? Let me know what has gone on with that in the comments section below. If you did enjoy this video, please make sure you like it and you share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon as well. But until next time, take it easy.